Cool. So um, uh, beside my um, area colleague from Audi, uh, I won't talk about the outfacing VR approach for a car company. We will here now talk about the internal application. Um, for this, I tried to get the presentation done as quick as possible, as quickly as possible to have a few minutes after that for Q&A. So I hope we get to that in time. Um, so first of all, who am I? So I'm Patrick Dams, um, and the team or the lead for VR and mixed reality at the BMW Group Technology Office USA, right down in Mountain View, so in the valley, um, and come from a background of offline and online rendering and experience design. So VR, awesome, cool. We are all aware how amazing it is and how cool it feels, and it's super fun, and we are probably all of us have seen some of these examples here. And we also know that it's not only for gaming, but also actually for creating content. Um, I want to highlight in this particular case, of course, Tilt Brush, with many of you are probably well familiar with, and also what you see in the center, uh, the Unreal Engine like VR um, development demo. Um, but unfortunately, that's not how it really works in the automotive context. The automotive context is way more about details and perfection and really about very little millimeter um, preciseness. And so therefore, they like Unreal Engine's approach currently, for example, does not, uh, is not applicable for what we do. Just to get you on board what this actually looks like, um, the design process currently at a company, so uh, an automotive company, I wrapped a little video here. There should also be some audio, but like with the audio presentation, we skipped the audio. <laughs> ah, there we go. To wrap up this, like the video, like in uh, useful stages for us here, uh, there are six different stages, and as you see in the little numbers, they are um, serial. So it means like you go from one step to the next. It's not like a quick iteration in between these steps. Starting with sketching, then we go to the one-to-one -one model, which means that you have a line-based model of the design where you can test ergonomics and stuff like this. Then you create like really detailed CAD data about, um, based on this, and then have a I call it a 2.5 dimensional review, which I mean you have the three dimensional representation of the vehicle in depth, but you're looking through a two dimensional screen um, and to talk about this. Then of course the clay model, which is a very, very late stage of this entire process and is very, very, very detailed. And then the final review where that like really it's like 100% done. If you look at all of these, they're actually pretty much three important points and it's pretty much the entire process is only about scale, color, and proportion. What I mean by that is that no matter what the designers are doing, currently, pretty much specifically, the proportion and scale is very late accessible for them. Um, and so therefore, we think that there's specifically through VR a huge potential to increase this because you can have a real, real three-dimensional perception of the room experience of a vehicle and the, yeah, the entire idea behind the concept much, much earlier than through this uh, very late um, clay approach. So looking at these th six uh, domains, there are improvements probably in four. Um, how did we tackle that? So to make every, like to actually replace or improve these new or these four domains in VR, we actually have to have a certain tool set actually just there in virtual reality. So we do a lot of in-house in development for this and particularly all the ones I go through here are built in-house and of course like not in the last week, so it's a long-term approach. We've, 
gun there. So the first thing is a NURBS paint, a NURBS paint tool. What that means is you're not only uh, like, for example, in Tilt Brush or wherever, where you just have a collection of points and create lines based on this, it's really that you can just point the, or like, like um, position the points and create like NURBS based on this, and then therefore, by combining multiple NURBS, actually create surfaces and therefore really actually create three-dimensional data, which is useful um, uh, for the automotive con uh, context. And of course, you need a spline modifier for that as well. Another thing is, as I said, like the one-to-one -one model. And what do you need for that to actually make that possible in VR? Um, you need a modifier. So what I mean by that is now imagine you, you created your three-dimensional concept of the vehicle. You have to actually not only sit in it, but actually modify objects. Like, for example, have a steering wheel and you want to move it. Um, you want maybe to change the position of objects and compare different locations of displays or whatever, or just switch through objects when you want to compare different designs of different um, dashboards, for example. Um, also, you, of course, need like some ergonomic testing tools, and there are, for example, the degree visualizer, distance measurement tools, and movement history. Degree visualizer, for example, means, let's say you are sitting on the seat, driver's seat and you open the door and you want to exactly know, hey, I have to open it that much to actually be able to get out. And then it shows you, oh, now the opening angle is 35 degrees. Or, for example, a movement history means that for, um, think about the steering wheel, which you can push up and down and adjust it to your position, that it actually saves this as a volume so that you really can look, okay, which volume is actually covered or occupied by a certain object. Um, the two-dimensional or 2.5-dimensional review in VR, so there is, of course, no, none of this anymore, means like you review a design in virtual reality. For this, we created a multi-user and um, approach, which means you can have a bunch of people in there. And they're also location independent, which means you can all put them together in VR, no matter if they are in Los Angeles, Shanghai, Munich, or wherever else at the same time. For this, we also do a screen share, of course, which means like you have a normal TV next to it where you can share what the person in VR is seeing, but also screen lock. With that, I mean, for example, if I'm as a designer and looking at the lights and say, from this angle, they really look bad. Someone else can, in VR, just lock to exactly my view and see the exact position, the exact location with the exact virtual reality uh, experience. So, and then follow me. And of course, we're all aware that it's not an easy thing to process motion sickness-wise, but it's actually quite helpful for making a final decision on a, on a discussion. Of course, also annotations and pointing has to be involved there to make like notes. And um, some new feature, for example, is a planar animated reflection mapping. What I mean by that is think about uh, one of the biggest issues right now is that if you have a real car clay model, it's usually often just brown, right? Like clay. And if you look from the side to the vehicle, it's difficult sometimes to gauge where exactly the curvation of the surface is going. Often you have, therefore, like some projectors and reflective materials to make this call. In VR, luckily, we can just map from the side lines on top of this which move through space, and you therefore can exactly see how this line gets distorted over time going along the side of the vehicle. Um, in this regard, for example, we just overcome the issue of real-time reflection calculation um, for such a review, which is, of, of course, very computation-heavy. And for a clay approach, just means pretty much we can also use laser-based data of real um, laser, laser tracked. Um, vehicles in clay. So you have the real car, you can just laser map it, put the point cloud data in the, in the environment and also look at it there. And some general features, um, which means all of this, what's happening in VR, we have a data export for this. So of course you can also use it then afterwards in different tools, um, like FRAT, Delta Gen, or whatever else you want to. And we have an enhanced tracking system, so we don't only, I will go in hardware in a little bit, not only the Vive Lighthouse tracking, but also some other um, advancements there just to ha have a bigger scale. And some VR optimizations, I wrapped it up in there. What I mean by that is, for example, that some basic mistakes we don't do or don't allow. For example, if you have a car, many people say, oh, how cool is it that I can make it fly and turn and how fancy. In this moment, just you cannot work. So for example, if you move a vehicle or an object, we lock certain axes, uh, certain axes to just make it easier to actually turn objects. Or, for example, we block that you can actually move a vehicle in a, in, a, in a way which is 
in real life not possible. So for example, we encountered that many people get very motion sick or very VR sick when they are standing in the hood of a vehicle. Because they look down and the brain is saying, oops, that shouldn't happen. And that gets many people, like they freak out, or for example, when they push it too, or pull it too fast, and then it just the whole car is flying through their face, like, oh, what's happening? And so we just blocked that, that exactly these issues don't happen, so you can pretty much, of course you can force it if you want to and need to, but we in basically always try to not make it available. So if you compared, the old process was a very, very, linear way, and luckily with all these tools, because they all work in the same VR environment, all at the same time, a lot before the claim all is happening can now happen in VR, and therefore enable us to have a way quicker iteration pro uh, cycle and can just test out way more, um, way more designs way quicker, which reduce costs and improve efficiency. Let's tackle technologies. Um, Pretty basic, so of course the Vive, thanks to the um, room scale tracking and the Lighthouse, which is an open standard, or kind of becomes, at least you can license this through Synapse and uh, Valve, which means you can create your own controllers, your own environments, your own trackable little objects, which is very helpful specifically for very specific applications in VR. And of course some feature sets are just quite nice, for example having the Chapron camera or Chapron mode in there. Uh, we use NVIDIA GeForce and Quadro, pretty much the 1080 um, for some, the 1080 uh, GeForce for some applications and the P6000 for other applications just because they are the fastest and more, for us most reliable ones. For the engines we use Unity 3D for UX prototyping. What I mean by that is whenever we have an idea about a new tool we want to use for the car design process, it's just for us the fastest to prototype than in Unity. Um, if we want to in the end say now, visual quality is for us important, we usually go back to the Unreal Engine. Um, and then when we are sure that some certain tools are useful, we then recreate them over there. We also, of course, tackle some basic limitations like resolution, the wired field of view, or the basic VR um, bottlenecks. But also, of course, we struggle with the quality difference of offline and online renderers. So if you compare let's say Unity and uh, a ray trace based system like FRET, it's just not the same quality. Also we tackle specifically issues regarding interior occlusion. What we mean by that is that of course the Lighthouse system doesn't like a lot of occlusion and when you're sitting in a vehicle concept for example and you just want to put on the uh, glasses and have your hands track very quickly the steering wheel or some other object is like occluding it. And another big issue for us is data incompatibility which means cat data is not easy, probably many of you have tried some certain kind of CAD data impl uh, implementation into an, offline, an online renderer like Unity can be quite painful, specifically if your CAD data has a zillion different configurations. So the outlook for us is to increase the uh, basic feature sets, so what I mean by, for example, the NURBS-based modeling tool and stuff like this, but also create new features, for example, like a voxel-based uh, modeling tool. So imagine that you actually have virtual clay and you can really just clay out of it. So you don't draw surfaces, but you have a block, and like with clay in VR. Um, and of course, we have to tackle some of the data incompatibility issue, and there are is of course a pretty obvious approach to wait until Fred and Delta Gen caught up with all the features we want. Or we just go two paths and say, hey, we just stick to how we do it right now and say for VR design reviews, we use still FRET because it's just the best visual quality. You cannot do as much in it as you want, but it's the best visual quality. But for the creation point, uh, we just use uh, online renderer tools. I also want to just take real quick the chance to highlight two recommendations. The one is Handlebars 3D VR Design Studio FRET plugin. It's a free tool which gives many people who have not so far gone that route to explore this a good starting point to see how design or review processes of very complex and detailed objects could look like in the future. Um, and with that, I try to go to the Q&A. Yes. What has been the most difficult with data incompatibility so far? Like with uh, the CAD versus other models? Yeah, so the thing is, oh, yeah. 
So I hope everybody heard that. So the question was, what is the biggest issue right now with the data and compatibility? So the issue right now is that for the on online renderers, you have to just have a lot of optimization happening to make the best visual quality, right? Light baking, material adjustments, HDR, blah, blah, blah. And so therefore, of course, this just takes a lot of time. Cleaning up meshes, having like, uh, like every, making it smart. Right? So for example, one thing to improve the quality or the, the, the time you need for light baking is that of course you have a mirroring, right? So you say for example, oh the seat on the left side is the same seat as on the right side, so easy. So we just mirror it and specifically also light baking data can be like reduced, for example, the ambient occlusion baking. But that takes time, right? You really have to go through all the objects where you say, oh, that, that makes sense to mirror, that doesn't. Um, oh, maybe there is a little difference actually in the objects. So the seed might be to 99.5% the same, but the little difference is then just like in a little detail. So this is just like very heavy. To, um, and of course, there should be just a better pipeline for that. Next question. Uh, Carlos Velasquez, Epic Scan. I'm curious if you envision the future of the clay modeling going away. Um, difficult to answer because I highly doubt actually that it is. Um, the point is more about in this regard to say, what do the designers prefer? And some designers prefer the more surface creation approach and some designers actually do the other approach to start with a clay and go from that. It's really just, it depends on the application um, and or like at least the, the preference of the designer. Um, who's going, or the, the one who actually makes it happen. So with VR, we enable, or we improve the quality of surface design much more. So actually it catches up a lot to clay. But clay in, the clay model approach in VR is still a thing, and in real life, if your question was pointed towards the real world clay model, never going away. For sure not, because it's always let's let's make it long story short. The VR perception of scale of a vehicle is just not correct. So when you have a real vehicle standing there, you're, you're, there's the focus. You cannot focus in VR. So there are little details which are just not correct. So it gives you a good hint VR, and it's very good, very close. But for the final call, and that's where Clay will come in and play. This will stay there for a long time, for a long time. Next question. Yeah, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, current status, um, is this just a pilot or is it rolled out with the majority of BMW designers? And the second question is, how, how did you convince the senior management to make this investment, to roll out this new technology? Okay, so first question, like how much is it actually rolled out in the company? Um, again, depends on where, but for design it is rolled out. That, Simple and to answer question two, um, how could we convince like upper management to actually go a route like this? The experience it just is way more efficient. It's faster and the iteration improvements, like the the cycle, the speeding up process, is just 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 there. It's outstanding. Of course, keep in mind that doesn't mean that everything is just fully replaced right now, right? Um, that will still take some time to really make the final transition. But it's all of these things are working. They are all in use and either have support or just for certain projects, just go this route. Last question. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you're dealing, I'm oh, sorry, Seth Sockle with Virtual Sky. Curious how you're dealing with uh, remote collaboration issues um, with you sitting here and your team sitting here in uh, Silicon Valley and then the, the team in Munich um, as well as getting support from some of the vendors like Unity and Unreal who are based here in the US and meanwhile your, your other team being in Munich. Mm -hmm. I just follow up question in which regard like issues or like latency or? Like if you want to look at the same thing at the same time, how do you do that? Actually it's not that, it's actually not that uh, difficult. So for example, let's assume, so the car data you can just have on each side, right? So you save a lot of data right there. So someone has this, full data here in, in the bay and the other has the same data there. So it's really only syncing the location, the position, which is a three-dimensional data set, as well as the rotation of the head, pretty much, and therefore you have the representation of each other, and also you can sync, therefore, rotation as well as orientation of the view. So the data amount is, for example, super small. We are really like talking about like a couple, uh, two kilobytes, maybe it's nothing. 
Um, so of course, there's still some latency. For example, if I move this hand here, it might be there like 0.3 seconds later. But for a collaborative environment, that works quite well. For the screen lock feature in particular, so when you, for example, say, oh, I want to exactly see what you're seeing, in this regard, it's even easier because you don't care at all about this, right? So if I, for example, right now look at this screen and this information gets to the other person who is locked into my view 0.3 seconds later, it doesn't matter because the the delay is so short that even like talking with each other, it has a longer delay than what you actually see and perceive. That's probably the best way. Thank you, Patrick. That's all the time we have for you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.